we've been doing these online discussions now for, um, shoot, we're 18 months or so. And um, probably every other discussion, somebody would bring up a topic and then the term solo aging started going around. So if we had an elder law attorney on, we'd get a question. I'm a solo ager and I'm concerned about who's going to take care of me uh, if I need help. And um, this solo aging topic just started coming up so frequently that I went online one day and sort of did a search for solo aging. And I stumbled into our panel member who um, has, has just written a book. It's not out yet called Solo and Smart. And so um, I, I tracked her down. I had a conversation with her. She's lovely and I, I love her story. And so I am really pleased to bring on Carol Merrick, who is going to lead us in what I think is a really important discussion and probably just the first that we have on this topic, because I know that there's a lot of interest on this topic and solutions for solo agers. So Carol, welcome. And uh, I'm, I'm in the mid-Atlantic in Washington, DC. Where are you located? Um. Thank you, Steve, for having me today. I am so grateful. And hello to all the participants and, and attendees. Welcome. Uh, I'm in Dallas, Dallas, oh, Texas. Wow. Okay, so you're, you're a little hour time difference here. Um, I always try to apologize to the California people because I know we, we, you just rolled out of bed and got, <laughs> got in front of the camera. Well, Carol, before we dive into this topic, let's get to know you a little bit better. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and um, then what led up to you taking an interest in finding solutions for solo agers. And I want to remind our audience, if there's any questions, comments, concerns on this topic, just type them into Q&A and uh, we'll make sure to address them. Great. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for, for asking. Um, I've been single most of my life. I have been married. Unfortunately, it did not work out. I think I've always been a very independent soul. So that's fine. <laughs> I'm solo aging and I'm, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I've been in the technology business most of my life in terms of a career. And then my parents, and I lived in California. And at the time, my parents started, uh, their health started to fail. So, and I also wanted to spend more time with them. So I moved back to Texas to help with their care. And uh, that, was, that was my wake up call. That, that's what showed me, Carol, this is what you're gonna face alone, unless you get married. And it was too late to have children because that time I was already 55. So uh, it, it really was my wake up call, caregiving was. And fortunately, it really helped me prepare for, for uh, all the things that I would likely face down the road. Well, now, um, and, and you know, one thing that's really important for folks to understand, you know, the, and, and I don't know if you'll address this later on, is, is that being a solo ager, it, it in your case, because you're single and you don't have kids, you can sort of see that, okay, I, as I grow older, I'm, I'm a solo ager, okay? You know, however, uh, what I see an awful lot of is folks that are, are married, they may or may not have children or what have you, but then or let's say a married couple, very dependent on each other and they don't have children and one spouse dies, boom, you're a solo ager. And that, those people really get hit by surprise. Um, I, I've had conversations with them off on a regular basis. So um, now just, uh, we're, I, I think you've got some slides you can share on some topics and things like that. But um, so you, you're in tech, you lived in California, came home, taking care of, of mom and dad, sort of opened your eyes to a bunch of things. Um, are you 
now or are you retired or did you retire to do this or like what is your your current working and job status you know that's that's such an interesting <laughs> that was an interesting transition i have to tell you because i was i was working full time when i was helping my parents and I, I, I moved back to Texas. I lived in Austin. My parents lived about an hour away. I had a full-time job. My two sisters were, were both retired and were doing really the bulk of the care for my parents. However, I would uh, do as much as I could and then got really involved as their, as their you know, health failed. Uh, but yes, I was working full time and what, what, what really kind of ushered in um, me going into senior care because I made that transition from high tech to caregiving. I mean, not just on a personal level, but in the business of caregiving, I started writing because at the time, then this was back in the early 2000s, there wasn't much information for caregivers. And, I, and where I was working about, there were close to 600 employees and about 30, about 30% 30 of us were family caregivers. We were taking care of our parents or, or, or someone, you know, an older relative. And we were all in the same situation. And I just, I heard conversations. I've heard, you know, throughout the hallways, over the cubicles and uh, people were losing productivity. and and I would, had gone to HR several times saying, hey, we need to create a support group here for us because we have no clue how to take care, of, how to do the things our parents need us to do, yet work full time. Well, HR would have nothing to do with it. So that's when I said, well, to heck with it. I'm just going to do it myself. <laughs> oh, I love it. I, this, one of the things that I love about these discussions is, is having entrepreneurs and innovators like you, you know, on, I, I love hearing the spirit and the ingenuity and, you know, the issues that we face when, the, you know, you could look at that as sort of an ageist viewpoint that your HR department is taking on, but it's more of a customer service uh, right. viewpoint that they're just not addressing the needs of their workplace. But here's the irony, and, and you know this to be true, and I think people in our audience knows, know it to be true. If the CEO was caring for their mom or dad, and that was an issue, and they walked into HR and said, we need to basically create a program because I know we've got other employees that are going through the same thing I'm going through, it would be done at a drop of the hat how you get these programs executed in an organization requires finesse, politics, and creativity, you know, and, um, but, but hats off to you for now uh, shifting and, and hats off for you for shifting. And you're also, you're solo. I mean, you're doing this, you're single and you're, you're, you're making that transition. Right. Yeah. Well, it, I guess I've always been an entrepreneur and very uh, motivated at heart all my life. So uh, I believe in change. I believe in making things better, not only for myself, but for other people. So um, and so when I heard all these stories at work, I mean, every there was this one woman, I'll never forget her, bless her heart. She would come in red faced into work, red faced, bawling, crying and flop at her uh, in her chair and sit at her desk and just and I'd walk up to her and she'd be bawling because she was so frustrated um, because she had children. She was in the sandwich generation. She had children that she was raising and her mother had had a, uh, a stroke and was living with her. So she was kind of in, be in between both of, of, uh, of that type of uh, stress and uh, God bless her. And so that was just one of the stories that I, that I experienced at work. I well, before we jumped on here, you were sharing 
with me a, um, a slide deck that I that I think is a really good part, way for us to start this conversation. Okay. And we want this to be a conversation, folks. So feel free to jump in with Q and A's and, and what have you. But um, uh, Carol has a, a book that's going to be coming out soon. She's got a YouTube channel. I'm going to share her website with everybody here right now. But let's um, let's kick this off with you sharing some of your insights from that slide deck, and then let's see where this conversation goes. Um, sure. And I also have. Um, Let's see, I think Mary sent in a good question before the event that we can address as well, whether or not you or I can answer it. Uh, maybe somebody in the audience can give some insights on Mary's solo aging question. So you should be able to share the screen there, Carol. Okay. All right. And... Whoops, there, let's see, it's loading. There we go, got it. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is where it all started. And just to give you some background, at this time I was working full time. Uh, of course, this was my parents. This, this photo was taken about six months before my mother died. So there's a whole backstory to even all before this picture was taken. But uh, so what happened was after they both passed away, uh, I was kind of thinking through, well, actually I was on a walk. I was crying because I was missing both of them. They were, they had just passed away. Uh, I was kind of reminiscing and thinking of all the issues or everything that we went through with mom and dad, because my dad had Alzheimer's, mother had several chronic illnesses that she needed a lot of care for. And I was just kind of thinking about all of the things they needed from the three daughters. Um, and as I, and then it just occurred to me, oh my God, what am I going to do? I don't have kids to do all that for me. So that's, and I, at the time I was about, you know, maybe 57 and I realized, you know, I better start putting together a plan because I'm alone. I don't have children to do all of these things. And these, these specifically were the ones that, uh, that my sisters and I helped my parents with. So I put together this little, uh, it's not really little, but uh, I'm going to flip through here. This was my roadmap. Uh, I would, I determined through my caregiving for both my parents that these are, were the top issues that many of us will face as we grow older. So if we want to age well, age independently, safely, and as, uh, I guess, as healthily as possible, to me, these are the top concerns that I started with. And I actually put together, uh, I'm going to kind of skip ahead. So uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to flip through this. This was the little, uh, I call the aging well circle. And I did this for myself. And, and so I started to think about how well I'm, I am, or how satisfied am I with these top issues or with these top aspects of aging. And, and, and quite frankly, if I can find it real quick, uh, so bear with me, I apologize, I should have had this all set up. But there it is. This is this is how once I started really evaluating, where am I right now with these top issues? And this is where this is where I, I rated them. So wow. as you can, you can see my money was probably my biggest concern. However, I started with my health because I knew without health, good health, excellent health, or as good as I can get it on my own, along with my doctor, then nothing else really mattered. You know, this is really, I really like this, um, Carol. I've, I, you, you know, this is obviously I've been doing this for 32 years and I've had conversations with so many people about topics related to this. But it, and, and everybody has a different way to sort of present and think about it. But I like what you've created here. This is a this is an excellent graphic. And 
what I what what I really think is pretty cool about it is is that you can modify it. Like I could see this in like a three ring binder, and <laughs> it's like a, a New Year's resolution where you basically are modifying it so that you know hopefully that money uh, pie gets bigger and then maybe your health pie starts shrinking if something happens, but it's a great barometer that addresses the, the whole holistic um, viewpoint on the way that you are presenting this. This is pretty cool. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I think so. It, it's a great way to measure your level of uh, uh, kind of really to get a full assessment or get some idea because many of us have no clue where to start when it comes to uh, the li our life domains and where we fall right now, you know, how do, how do they rate according to ourselves, right? How do we mm -hmm. rate them right now? And then which might, would give us a roadmap to, well, this is what I need to work on because we have no clue. Well, where do I start? You know, I, I talk with people all the time and they say, but how do you put together a plan and where do you start and how do you make adjustments? And so, yeah, so this at least gives you a place to start, I think. You, you know what I'd love to do? Like when, when we were talking before here, I said, Carol, you got so many people interested in this topic. This, we got to do more of these. But I would find it really interesting, people of all ages, whether we're solo agers or not, because I had said in the beginning, you might think you've got this big family and you got the, the, you know, great husband or wife and, you know, everything's great. But we all know, especially those in the senior serving world, you can outlive all of those people and become a solo ager. So if you're prepared to be a solo ager, you're actually, you're, you're going to be better prepared for the future, no matter what. I would love to see, have you ever done, use this in like a workshop format where you passed out a sheet of paper and had people sort of do these individual, um, create their own pie charts and then chat about it amongst each other? I think it would be fascinating. Uh, yes, uh, I have done that and I continue to do it and I would love to do it with you. Oh, I, I love it. <laughs> and with Thank your you. participants, yes. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. Um, Holly said, and and I picked up on this too. I think your earrings are bumping up against your microphone. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, let me. You know, I had thought that when I put it on, uh, I'm gonna. I thought, Carol, I think these earrings are too big. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So bear with Great. me. I'm gonna take them off so okay. I'm not. Okay. Uh, and actually, while I'm you're doing that, it, it yes. looks like Emmy. It looks like Emmy has her hand raised and may have something. Uh, a question or okay. she wants to ask something. Sometimes that's by mistake. So Emmy, if you um, if your hand was raised and you had a question or you wanted to ask something, um, I just clicked the unmute button for you. Um, if not, just ignore it. Uh, a lot of times people are playing around with the, um, uh, the hand raising thing. Um, let's see. Um, uh, here's a good, uh, Peggy is, says, it is unwise to make assumptions about who will support you and far better to plan on assuming you will be a solo ager. Pretty good point there, Peggy. I, 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 I like that. Um, Absolutely. Even okay. if you have children, that's right. Yeah. You can't count um, on them to be around. That's well, right. and what I find, and what's interesting, I find the profile of people that move that I talk to who are investigating life plan communities, that they they come primarily, and I'm drawing a stereotype, they come in two two sorts. It's the solo agers that are looking at it so that they can be taken care of no matter what. But then the other category are the people. Actually, it's very similar to you, Carol. They went through a caregiving process. They may be married. They may have a large family, but they're moving into a life plan community so that they aren't a burden on their children. And um, so that's interesting. Okay, let's see. 
Um, Emmy probably raised her hand by mistake, but it looks like Sally Ann has raised her hand. Um, so either Emmy or Sally, Sally Ann? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for this. Um, I wonder if you might consider adding another um, aspect of this wheel, which is um, as we get older, I think one of the things that seems to be most important is a sense of where we find meaning and purpose. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah. I think absolutely. Um, the rest of this is very pragmatic, but I think there's an increasing emphasis on inner growth. Actually, I have even, I, this is my kind of short, my abbreviated uh, mm -hmm. aging wheel circle. <laughs> I have one that has 12. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm glad you hit us with these, but <laughs> I do like, I, I do, because again, just like solo aging, the topic of finding purpose, especially if you're so losing important. Your ability or whatever is so important. So yeah, on the amended one, uh, yeah, throwing that in would be super important. And, you know, um, so I'm really glad you brought that up, Sally Ann. The, um, the, uh, the other thing when we talk about sort of revisiting this on an annual basis or periodically, you know, I find that oftentimes people's purpose can, can move back and forwards. Like COVID-19 is a great example. Right. A lot of us had purpose that required us to get in our car and go somewhere, and we had to reinvent and rediscover purpose in front of our computer screens like we are right now and, and isolated at home. So uh, really great comments there, Sally Ann. Anything else that you'd like to add? Um, no, I just think this is a wonderful topic. Um, and I think there's not been enough emphasis in our society at large on people who are living alone. Yep, but I, I, I totally agree. As a matter of fact, Sally, you would probably be interested, you will find it uh, online. Uh, it was a research paper uh, by, I think it was her, she's a geriatrician out of New York. And her name is uh, Maria Carney, and that's C-A-R-N-E-Y. And she did, it wasn't really research. She really did an essay, basically, or a paper uh, from other research that was done on, uh, so, well, she calls us elder orphans, because that's her experience of, through the, in the medical uh, field is uh, elder orphans, because we, we can be, uh, we have many, I mean, if we don't take care of these issues, we're at high risk of uh, becoming an elder orphan, meaning that no one, that we have no one to take care of us. We have no one looking out for us. We, uh, so we end up totally alone in a nursing home or maybe in the hospital or where have you. So she did a, a, a you know, basically a kind of a, a an, I'm just call it a research paper and it's called Elder Orphans Hidden in Plain Sight. And she really kind of gears it toward uh, providers and professionals who are in the aging sector on ways of how they can better tune in to people like us who are aging alone. And many times when I go to my doctor, uh, I, I really encourage her to ask me more questions about my life because I'm alone. And this, and I have to say, I'm very happy that she has really adjusted her, uh, her assessment when she, when I come into the office and hopefully she's doing it with all of her patients now, because we are hidden and we're not really, uh, uh, our issues aren't being or haven't been addressed. They're starting to get addressed by professionals. Yes, but still, yes. it's we got a long ways to go. Great, thank you for that. Well, thanks a lot, Sally. And um, I uh, I added a link to that um, to that paper um, on in chat, and also an article that you wrote uh, popped up when I typed that in. Um, but you know, let's, let's also like address the language that we use. I actually like that. And, and, and I'm, I'm soliciting audience participation on this one. 
I, I like the term solo aging. There's something powerful about that. Like, I don't feel that it's a negative. Prior to that, the elder orphan term was the thing that, that everybody used when they would talk about this topic. And it was so um, declinist and um, I felt negative. And um, I, I mean, it, one, one good reason to use the elder orphan language is, is that it can promote change. So for example, if you're running a, an assisted living or nursing home and you have a percentage of your residents that don't get any visitors, that have no family, and it's sort of like, if you're in a boardroom, you're like, look, we have to help our elder orphans. That, that language can activate change but I like the idea of solo age. I like the term solo aging. Maybe there's, maybe there's a better term. Maybe our audience uh, can come up with, uh, Karen, uh, Karen says, I agree. I like solo aging much better than elder orphan. Um, the um, Mary says, I agree. Well, people are agreeing with me. This is fantastic. So, uh, <laughs> Um, we, and I'm in total agreement. I, I much prefer solo aging as opposed to uh, elder orphan. However, I have to say my purpose when, when I use that term is to build awareness. And, and I knew that I would have, get more response from, uh, from journalists, from the professionals in the industry, from whomever, if I said elder orphan. It was like, oh, you know, yes. I mean, they really perked their or piqued their interest. However, as as a just a person like me, uh, just a regular person, I prefer saying I'm a solo ager. <laughs> I don't say, well, I'm an elder orphan because I don't even think of myself as elder or elderly. Yep. So the um, uh, all right. So uh, let's see. Uh, keep on going. And uh, oh, oh, wait, we got some questions that popped in here. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Thanks. Thank you so much for. So what are. The, oh, yeah. So someone's asking when you brought up the 12 categories, can you do you have a slide where you can share the. I the don't think I have it in this slide deck and I would oh, okay. have to I would have to go out. But it, let's do another. Uh, a few more of these workshops and uh, and we'll take a deep, much deeper dive. Okay, great, great. But so, should I share, continue sharing my well, Yeah, screen? yeah, no, this is great. And, and also I wanna, uh, <laughs> uh, Jennifer Brown has a really good um, uh, comment that she's sharing that is aging solo is a common reality for many LGBTQ older adults. And I will tell you guys, like one of one of the most emotional, um, eye-opening films that I watched is called Gen Silent. And um, in the Gen Silent film, there is a, a transgender woman who, because of her, um, uh, she was separated from her family and um, she started having severe health problems and she was clearly a solo ager. And um, the, one of the beautiful things that occurred in that film was how the community, her, her community of friends and um, the LGBT center, I believe in her community came together to support her. But one of, the, one of the things that is revealed in that film, this was not something that she planned for. Like, so what, what sort of happened is there was this outpouring of support, but it wasn't something that she mapped out. And therefore um, she began to be a little bit resistant to it. Uh, it, 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 didn't, it didn't continue on. And I, that, that's where I think that us having discussions like this and people mapping out their plans and thinking about where their social connections are gonna be and their support is gonna be if something happens is really important. Yeah, and I also, and I agree totally, and I encourage everyone to create their own 
kind of peer, what I call peer advisory groups <laughs> and come together and, and to talk about these issues. And, and as you can see here, the, these are some of the reasons that many of us need to uh, create a plan and to start thinking through some of the things that get in our way or hinder us from aging well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and I, I run a group now, it's a private group, but uh, if anyone's interested, certainly contact me. However, uh, I encourage everyone to just put together their own little peer advisory group to start thinking about some of the issues that, uh, that you face. Because everyone else, if, if they're in the same situation, they, they're facing the same issues and the same concerns. Uh, I know several groups that, that do this automatically. They check in on one another. They'll text each other every day. They will share their uh, legal papers just in case someone goes to the hospital. They give each other rides. They go shopping for one another. They take suit to each other if they're sick. So it's just really creating your own family-like environment and community. Oh, and before I forget, and, and I, I hope you're okay with me jumping in here, Carol. Oh, absolutely. Um, I want to make Please. sure that we that we throw out the, the question that Mary had before yes. the discussion even uh, started. And I'm not sure that me or Carol will have a, a, a great answer for Mary, but I'm hoping that the audience can be supportive. And she says, I'm looking forward to today's presentation. My particular question is how to find or manage the need for health care power of attorney and financial power of attorney when there's no personal option available. I've only received shrugs when I have posed this question. And, um, you know, Mary, um, we've had several discussions with care managers and elder law attorneys where this has come up. And not all care managers and not all elder attorneys will serve as a power of attorney. But the one thing that I that that seems to be the common theme on those two elements is finding somebody that you trust. And sometimes, you know, with the elder law discussion on power of attorney and healthcare power of attorney, that they're often sort of saying, look. If you don't trust your kid to make the right decisions for you, then have your best friend be your healthcare financial power of attorney. Um, but I know that there are some professions that you can pay, like like a daily money manager or a care manager or a, or somebody to to do those roles. My advice would be based on what I've heard is I would forge a relationship with that provider before you move into this. So like maybe working with an aging life care manager who could serve as your healthcare and financial power of attorney, work with them first on a plan like what Carol is proposing, a care plan for the future, build that trust. And then once you're confident that you really have a good relationship, then maybe have those documents. Carol, any thoughts on your end on, on Mary's question? Um, well, my first question to Mary would be, uh, do you have a close friend or several friends? Uh, or uh, obviously she doesn't have a sibling or, or a child, adult child. Uh, then if you don't have a, a friend that would step in for you, someone that you really trust, then I, personally, as a matter of fact, I might right now, my sister who is older than me is my healthcare proxy and my financial proxy. However, I'm going to change that because I, it's not that I don't trust my sister. It's just first, she's older than me. Uh, second, um, because she loves me, she may have a hard time letting me go really seriously. So I, I am going to hire either a care manager or a patient advocate who will, who will basically be in charge and then have 
two or three of my good friends that I trust to be in partnership with my with the care manager so that they can overwatch to make sure that individual is carrying out my wishes. And I would do the same with a, with a certified fiduciary that you can hire as well or a daily money manager to oversee or be your uh, selected uh, uh, financial proxy, so to speak. And again, have your friends work with them as a team so that you know, because you want to make sure that your wishes are being followed, period. Yeah. And uh, I trust, I have good, some really good friends that I trust with my life. So I would have them oversee. I would even have my sister included in that team. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I really, for me, I, uh, the more I think about it, the more research, research I do, I want a professional who's heading it up. I love it. Yeah, and, and one of the things, and as you can see in chat, I'm going to read some of the comments that have gone in on this topic. There's no, there's no one way to address this. This, is, this can be, can't, you have permission to customize and, and map out your roadmap however you see fit. And, and there's a lot of, I, I love how you've sort of thought about this and you've got this blend of friends, family, and paid um, staff. So I'm just going to sort of paraphrase a couple of the comments coming in for, for Mary and for the rest of the people. Uh, Bird and Bird is an elder law firm in the DC metro area. And they say many solo aging people have used our elder law services. We have had to be advocates for some and do handholding. Um, I'm so glad you're talking about this as many people are coming to us too late. Um, Lori says, as a certified aging life care manager, there are many of us across the country who do, who will do power of attorney and healthcare surrogate. Relying on friends changes can change, and a friend, a friendship can be dynamic. Just you illustrated that family can be dynamic as well, you know. And right. um, and Peggy says, you know, friends could act as a POA for you. In fact, they're probably better than having siblings or children do so in order to avoid the emotional conflict, which is what you talked about with your sister and what? of interest. Um, and Jane says it's a big ask to, it, it really is. I mean, it is a big ask. And that's that's the other thing. And again, now we're going down the elder law uh, rabbit hole. But one of the things when we ask our friend, when we ask somebody to be power of attorney, um, we need to realize what a big ass that is. And so I, I, I think some, somebody much smarter than me said, when you ask somebody, say, you, you know, number one, honor this, that it, it would be my honor that you serve this, but I recognize that I'm as, this is asking a lot, so I'm giving you permission to say no or to modify right. it. Um, right. Let's see. Uh, let me, I'm going to interject a story here because it, it really happened in my life. I live in a high rise and it happened to a person here where I live. She was a power of attorney for a good friend. He was a solo ager and he passed away and, and she was left with being the financial and the healthcare proxy. Uh, I cannot tell you how much work it was for her. <laughs> and, but fortunately for her, he had set up um, a way to pay her for her time, which worked out very well because he paid her very well. So if, if that could relieve some burden for a good friend, then pay them, put it in your will that they get whatever, you know, that's, that's up to you. But uh, but it is a lot of work. I watched her. I mean, she was very concerned and not only concerned about getting it right, but, you know, making sure that she could find the will, get it all together. It, and she's still working on it. And he passed away about six months ago. So it is not an easy feat. That's for sure. Um, and Mary... Uh, Karen says, um, I have had the same problem as Mary, but my close friends have settled their 
but my close friends had settled their parents' estates and they were stressed by it. So is a lawyer a good choice to do this with, or is there a better option? You know, um, I, I am definitely, we need another elder care, elder law panel. I'm going to try to schedule something in September and maybe, maybe we can have sort of a focus on this because I know we could, uh, we could really um, dive into this much deeper. Um, yeah, yeah. If you're, you know, I would make a list of all the professionals who would address this. You know, like a fiduciary, like a certified fiduciary, a financial, uh, some type of financial advisor, an elder law attorney, a care manager, a patient advocate, and start interviewing them. Maybe three or four professionals in that category. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it takes time but you're, you'll be better off for it. Oh, whoops, I didn't see there's some people with their hands raised. So Betty, um, I'm gonna unmute you if that's not an accident. Uh, no, hey it's there, not Betty. A, um, I wanted to say that in my own experience, it is the men who are not prepared to be solo agers. They kind of assume that their wife's gonna be around. Um, and I don't hear men in this discussion. Is this kind of accurate for you, Carol, or is that just my life experience? Um, uh, no, it's, it's accurate. However, there's a lot of women that are in the same boat. They're more dependent on their husbands to do, you know, to take care of uh, the day-to-day -day yeah. responsibilities. So it, work, it really works both ways. And, and in my Facebook group, um, of course, I don't have that many men in the group, but most of the men that are in my group have been a solo person for a long time. So they are well equipped and taking care of themselves. I don't have any, I don't know very many married men. I know my brother, he's married and he's older than me. And I have to say he is totally dependent on his wife. So I'm in the group, but I'm in agreement there. But I see there's a lot of women that, uh, that have become recent widows and they are just stumped. They just, they don't know what to do. Uh, and I'm really sorry to hear and see it. Thank yeah, you. I, I've observed the same thing, Betty. And um, the, uh, and, uh, but yeah, it does go both ways. I think, I think the bigger issue is, is that when you're in, uh, when you've got a strong re married relationship, it, it should be dependent on each other. And it's very hard for anybody to sort of imagine that you won't be together right up to, you know, leaving this earth. And, um, um, but that happens so rarely. And uh, so there's going to be somebody who's left behind and, and thinking about this. Let's see, Janine uh, Clark, has her hand raised. Um, Janine, um, feel free to unmute your mic if, if that's not a mistake. And um, then let's see, Robert, what, while we're waiting to see, Robert says, how do you screen your affinity family? Um, you, you know, um, screening, meaning, you know, when you're looking at folks that are going to be your network, as a solo ager, how do you, do, any, any words of wisdom on that? Uh, well, first off, be very patient. You know, when I moved into, uh, because I was living at the time before I moved here, I was living in the suburbs and I felt very isolated and alone. And uh, so I decided, I did a lot of research. I moved into an urban area, uh, into a high rise. And I thought, well, good, I have neighbors all around. I'll be making friends. I'll have uh, my own little uh, affinity group or my only family-like uh, type of community. Well, <laughs> it doesn't happen overnight. So if you, it, it took about uh, two to three years for people to become familiar with me, to see my face, uh, you know, walking around the halls and going downstairs and having coffee. You know, it takes, it takes a while for people to start trusting each other. Um, so, 
So, you know, I'm not sure there's any type of set strategy in, mm -hmm. in, in building of relationships and community is just keep doing it over and over and over again. Go to several places, go to meetup groups if you can, uh, do online events, go to your senior center. And, and senior centers, we hear that, we go, oh, God, that sounds awful. But they are really uh, becoming much more active. They're, they, they're starting to call themselves active adults, you know, yeah, active actually, adult yeah. communities. And yeah. Yeah, so go places where you have, where there are peers and you have things, to, hobbies, you mm -hmm. know, uh, workshops, what have you, take a class and, and keep showing up. Well, Sorry, that, that's why I love your pie chart is, is that it, it, if you're honest in sort of doing the pie chart, you're creating a, an assessment of your current situation and you're creating goals is because you may not even think that I need to sort of expand my network, but in reality, you do. Okay. Um, so Adriana says, how's the pandemic impacted this population, isolation concerns increased, or did the support systems get stronger? Um, you know, again, I think a lot of this is individual, but um, uh, Carol, I'm interested in your thoughts on that with the, uh, the solo agers you're talking to. Um, the first thing it did, it, it raised awareness of those of us who are isolated and alone. It was, it, so what, what, what is that term? It highlighted, it really highlighted and uh, around our issues around us being alone. And um, however, I mean, that's on, that's on, I think that's a good thing. That's a good thing that it raised awareness about isolation and loneliness. And then another good thing it did it, it really helped people like me, or not me so much because I'm very active, but people who have a tendency not to be too active and they're living alone to start doing something about it because I think it exacerbated their loneliness. It, uh, you know, they had to wear a mask. We had to, we couldn't go shopping very much. We couldn't connect with those friends of ours to have lunch. We couldn't do anything, so that really exacerbated the problem, which forced us and forced people to look for ways, other ways to make to create connections. Um, some people did it, some don't. They still don't. Um, and I'm sorry to say, uh, but most people, I think, have learned to adapt and do online activities with with. Uh, places like the o Oasis, Osher Learning, uh, Lifelong Learning Institutes, our libraries, they have public events online and classes. So there's a, a whole new venue of things uh, occurred from this pandemic. Does that answer your question? I, I think it's great. I mean, this is, I think discussions like this are more thought provoking and getting us thinking outside of the box and thinking different for ourselves, our loved ones and our clients. Um, this is a good one here. It says family relationships and family energy dynamics are so interesting and so complex and complicated, but very beautiful. So how's your sister gonna respond and feel about this when you tell her you were changing the <laughs> estate organized relationship? <laughs> Um, well, I think as long as it doesn't affect the, uh, well, quite frankly, I hate to say this, but as long as she remains, uh, you know, it, how can I say this, uh, as the, the lead beneficiary of everything, she'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, she might actually, I think a lot of family members would embrace the fact that they've got, that you're, that I, I like your team approach, because I think it's a lot of burden for somebody to carry on their shoulders. And we also recognize no matter what somebody's age is, we could be outlived by these people or we could outlive these people, you know, what have you. So um, right. let's see. Um, okay, somebody says, could you ask Bird and Bird Elder Law if they would be willing to sh share how they can be contacted? We think it was Mary Motor. Uh, Mary, make sure that you 
you drop your contact information into chat again. Um, and Mary, since you're on this discussion, I would love to have some folks from your team um, uh, jump on and we could maybe do a solo aging topic on, uh, on the legal aspects uh, of this. Um, let's see, uh, let them know you, this somebody says, let them know you're giving them permission to say no and that you will honor their decision and their choice. Um, uh, oh, when will your book, Eileen says, when will your book be available and who is the publisher? Um, the book will be published next year in 2002, uh, 2022. And there I'm in conversations with two publishers. The, the manuscript is done. And okay. as a matter of fact, Great. I have, um, and I, I'd rather just announce the one who, who I select. Got as it. a publisher, and then, but I'm in conversations with you. Because I've interrupted you so many times, Eileen also <laughs> says, are there any other slides that the, that, that the author wants to share with us? So like, do you have any other things in your slide deck that you think would be um, powerful? Well, I, I would like to uh, do a workshop. Uh, I love this idea. I, so, I love this little pie thing. I'm really curious about that. So to answer your question, that was Elaine, right? That asked that question. Eileen, yeah, yeah. Eileen, um, thank you for asking. Uh, I, would you attend a workshop if we put one on? Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> Mary has already said she would. And uh, yeah, people are saying in chat. And you know what's cool is I've got this platform called Remo. Some of you, some of you in the audience are familiar with it. And what it allows us to do is sit at tables with four to six people at each table. So what I could see us doing is we come together, you sort of lead us through this with some ideas, and then we break into our little groups and we all you know, create our pies and talk about it and, and have a discussion. Let's, let's give that. it a shot. I think this yeah. is really a cool idea. I, yeah, I, okay. I, Yes, gotta, and so to answer your question, Eileen, I have lots of great slides that are thought provoking. Okay, and um, well, we're almost to the top of the hour. So, you know, what I wanna do before we jump off is I wanna share my screen because I wanna make every, but sure everybody knows how to get in touch with you and your website and everything. So this is, uh, let's see, and, here we are. And one thing, if you don't mind, if I, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, I, I uh, deliver videos, short videos that offer achievable tips for people who are growing older alone um, or even duo. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're, even if you're living with someone. Uh, okay. But I also interview experts also that we have conversations like this. Great. So here's, Carol's um, website, carolmerrick.com. And then you can see up here on the navigation thing, if you click on solo and smart YouTube, it will direct you to her YouTube page. So that's, um, I wanted to make sure that we, we shared that with everybody. I'll, I'll, I'll send that out when I send oh, out thank the, you. Uh, the recording thank you. as well. Thank you. Um, we've got a few more questions and then we'll wrap things up. Um, let's see. We know someone under the age of 60 who was admitted to a hospital for emergency surgery. There were complications with the surgery and they were admitted to intensive care for many days and hours. They had chosen their sister as a healthcare proxy and power of attorney because she was a nurse during, and during this life-changing event, we all came to learn that their sister did not like his wife and children and would not give anyone in the family any information about his condition. To say it as lovingly as possible, this turned into a living will nightmare. They survived, but what a lesson. Um, so again, Carol, your comment about patience and conversations can't be reiterated enough. Um, let's see, Andrea says, where can we find the resource document book for the to-do list for single aging people? Um, did you... Well, we'll have, a, uh, we'll have a workshop on it. Okay, yeah. So, so Andrea, stay tuned for our workshop. We'll deal with that. And Elaine says, great topic today. Thanks to everybody.
I, I couldn't agree more. We we've really we've we've stumbled into something here that I think is super powerful. And th what I love about these online discussions is, is that we can interact. I know I need to shut up and stop talking as much, but guys, I'm I'm I using chat. You guys are doing a great job communicating on this topic. And Carol, you you are wonderful, and I'm so glad that our paths have crossed and uh, I'm looking forward to um, this just being the start of a really exciting, I'd like to call it a movement, you know? I mean, this is the solo aging movement and let's, let's, let's empower people. And, Absolutely. Um, yes, uh, and let's, let's, get, let's empower people to create their own uh, trustworthy or trusted type of uh, community and family-like environment mm -hmm. because we can. And the, the one thing I want to leave with you is that you do have the wherewithal. You have it within yourself to create a life that is safe, secure, and independent. Yep. This is awesome. Great way to finish things off. Uh, Carol, we'll be seeing you soon. Audience. Great. Thank you, Spread Steve. the word. Thank you, everyone. We're going to really move on this one. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.